Hi everyone. So this is uh, final review, review for the final exam. Um, I did not get any specific questions. Uh, uh, so I'm just going to pick some random problems and I figure I would start at the beginning with uh, number one, part A. Uh, evaluate the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over x plus 1 minus 1, and then all of that over x. Well, uh, anytime you see limits, maybe the first thing you, you can always do is just try plugging in the number, right? Is this function, right, is this thing continuous at x equals 0? Right, of course not, right? And you, you can check. If you, if you plug in x equals 0 here, this is what you would get. Um, already you can see you're dividing by 0, so that's not good. And this is just 1 minus 1, which is also 0. So you get 0 over 0, which, of course, um, is not the answer. Right? That's never an answer. 0 over 0 is undefined. It's meaningless. Okay. So, yeah, so that didn't work. But again, when you're finding a limit, that's the first thing you should always try. Um, so what should we do instead? Well, Obviously, uh, it, it all, the directions just say find the following limits, so you could do it any way you want. You can draw a graph, or you can start plugging in numbers that are close to zero, right? Do it numerically. But in most cases, it'll say to do it algebraically, which means we're just going to do the, the usual algebra here. Uh, hang on, that wasn't supposed to happen. Okay, all right. So, uh, yeah, so let's... Just rewrite it. We have the limit x goes to 0 of 1 over x plus 1 minus 1 all over x. And you can see this is sort of an awkward way to write this, uh, especially when you have this fraction within a fraction. So what makes sense here, I think, is to just multiply by x plus 1, right? And then do the same thing in the denominator. Multiply that by x plus 1, right? So let's see, what do we get? Well, when you distribute the x plus 1 here, that's kind of the whole point, you cancel the x plus 1 in the denominator, right? So you get x plus 1 over x plus 1 right? minus x plus 1, don't forget the parentheses, right? divided by x times x plus 1. Okay, and then this, of course, is just is just one. So x is still approaching zero here, right? So to simplify this, we get one minus, and then distribute the negative sign. You get x minus one, and then there's no reason to multiply this out. I'll leave it as x times x plus one. Makes sense. And of course, 1 minus 1 is 0, so the numerator is just negative 1 times x. And now you can see what's going to happen. We're going to cancel with this x in the denominator, right? So, so these just cancel, and we're going to end up with, if I can go here now, x approaching 0 of negative 1 over x plus 1. And now there's no problem. Now you can replace x with 0. So this is continuous. Having, having canceled these x's here on the left, um, now it's continuous. So now you can just plug in 0, and you just get negative 1. So that's the answer, negative 1. So I hope that helps. Um, and part b and c, again, very similar. You just have to simplify, right? Do a little bit of algebra simplify and hopefully cancel whatever it is in the denominator that's giving you zero in the denominator, right? So that's the idea uh, for limits. Okay, moving on to derivatives. So they gave us this function here, x squared plus 1 over x cubed minus 1, and we want to find the derivative. So you might, you might ask, can I simplify this a little bit? And not, not to any extent that this might be helpful. So I would really just apply the, the quotient rule here. Um, 
what you could do, of course, is factor out the x minus 1 in the denominator, but notice that that doesn't really gain you anything. Nothing cancels. So, so yeah, so you, you could do this, of course. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just going to apply the quotient rule directly to this. Okay, so for the derivative, remember for the quotient rule, you have denominator squared, and then you have low d high minus high d low. So denominator, and then the derivative of the numerator is just 2x plus 0 minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. The derivative of the denominator is 3x squared minus 0. Right, and you usually get this pretty big mess here. So let's multiply out the, the numerator here. We're going to get 2x to the fourth minus 2x to the one, right? So just minus 2x. And then minus 3x to the fourth. And then another minus. Remember, this is a plus, but then the minus distributes, right? So minus 3x squared. And there's no reason to multiply out the denominator. So we'll leave that alone. Um, so just combine like terms. We have, what do we have here? 2x to the fourth minus 3x to the fourth is negative x to the fourth. And then we have minus 3x squared minus 2x. So notice that, um, Yep, pretty much everything is negative in the numerator, so I would factor out the negative. And we can also factor out an x. So that's going to be x cubed uh, plus 3x plus 2 times x cubed minus 1 squared. And I think think we can factor the numerator, right? This is just x plus 1 times x plus 2. Although, no, I don't, I don't know why that was necessary because, again, nothing, nothing cancels with anything in the denominator here. So you don't have to write it out this way. Oops, there's no 2. It's just x squared plus x plus 1 plus 1 squared. So, right. so you can leave it in factored form, or you could have just left it, I guess, this way. And then leave this as x cubed minus 1 squared. So either way is fine. Um, yeah, so in, in this case, we're just testing, do you know the quotient rule? Right, so the quotient rule low d high minus high d low, d for derivative, of course, and then low low, low squared in the denominator, right? So, so yeah, quotient rule, obviously product rule, uh, all, the, all the rules for derivatives, chain rule, right? That didn't really come into play here, I don't think. We didn't need the chain rule, but uh, in, in many cases you will. Okay, so we'll do another one. This is part C. Uh, the, the function g of x is cosecant of log x, right? And log is a pretty recent uh, function we've, we've talked about, but that was in chapter 5. But So you should know how to deal with logarithms now. So how do we find the derivative, right? Because we're looking for g prime of x. So what's the derivative of this? Right? So be careful. This is not secant times log, right? So d yeah, don't think of this as a product rule. Right? This is not cosecant of x times the log of x, right? You're taking the cosecant of the log of x. So, so, so you, you take your x, you take the log of that number, then you take the cosecant of that number. Okay, so it's not a product, right? Not a product rule. But it's a function of a function, right? So it's a chain rule. So this is where we need the chain rule. So what's the derivative of cosecant? It's negative 
cosecant times cotangent, cotangent, and you're taking log x, right? And then the chain rule says now you have to multiply by what's on the inside. What's the derivative of log x? And again, that, that's a recent one. So that's, that one is one you should remember, I hope. So the derivative of log x is just 1 over x. Right? And so that, that's it. Um, we can just copy that down. In, in fact, we can bring the 1 over x in front. Sorry, that's an x. Um, or you can write it all over x. And my guess is that's how it appears in the answer key, but again, I'm not, oops, log x, cotangent of the log of x, yep. And then all divided by x. So that's fine too. Right. So yeah, the, the 1 over x right comes from the, the chain rule. So make sure, make sure you apply the chain rule here. Um, that's mostly what this is about here. Yeah, and then D should be a quick one. Uh, they're really just testing you, do you know the difference between the power rule and the exponential rule, right? So remember here, pi is a constant, right? So pi is a constant, right? 3.14 and so on. Um, so, we're, first of all, we're using the sum rule, right? That this, the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. So, so, yep, when you take the derivative of x to the pi plus pi to the x, you can just take the derivative of x to the pi and then add to that the derivative of pi to the x. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, okay, so I don't know what happened there. So there's a little technical problem here. Um, okay, hang on. Okay, there we go. All right, so uh, yeah, I'm still just getting used to this. This is not ideal. All right. So how do we take the derivative of x to the pi? Uh, well, if pi is a constant, this is x to the n. And you remember the derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1, right, for derivatives. Um, no chain rule necessary here since x, this is just x, right? Uh, yeah, so this is just pi times x to the pi minus 1. Now, what about the derivative of pi to the x? Yeah, this is a very recent one, right? This is pretty much the last thing we talked about is taking the derivative of a to the x. It's just a to the x times the natural log of a, right? Obviously, if you have the derivative of e to the x, uh, can squeeze that in here, then you just get e to the x because the natural log of e is just 1. But this is not e, this is pi. And yes, they're, they're kind of close, right? e is about 2.7, pi is about 3.1, but they're not exactly the same thing. So, right, so this is just going to be pi to the x times the natural log of pi. And that's it. Okay. So again, just make sure you know the power rule. This is the power rule for derivatives. Make sure you know the exponential rule as well. It doesn't come up very often, but... Uh, we did need that one here. Okay, so number three, y is equal to e to the 2x, and we want to find the equation of the tangent line at uh, x equals log 2. So let's start with the equation of, well, just any line. Uh, the equation of a line is, let's use point-slope form, y minus y0 equals m times x minus x0. Okay. 
and the x0 is, is given, right? The x0 is just natural log of 2. So what's y0? It's e to the 2 natural log of 2, right? Because that's what y is, right? Um, so y0 is just going to be, let's see, e to the natural log of 2 squared, which is e to the natural log of 4, which is 4. So, right, so there you go, x0, y0 is just log 2, comma 4, right? So the only thing left to do now, of course, is uh, to find m. And because it's a tangent line, the way to find m, right, is to find the derivative of y. Uh, yeah, let's just call it dy by dx, right? And then plug in x equals log 2. So first of all, what's the derivative of e to the 2x? It's e to the 2x. And then the derivative of 2x by the chain rule is 2. So this is just 2 e to the 2x, right? Okay, so that, that's the derivative. That's y prime. And now plugging in x equals log 2, we get 2 e to the 2 log 2. And remember, we already calculated e to the 2 log 2 as just 4. So 2 times 4 is 8. Right? So that's my m. And you can take it from here. Uh, at least I hope you can. All you're doing is just plugging in the numbers now. y0 is 4, m is 8, x is x, and x0 is the natural log of 2. So we might as well solve for y, right? If you add, well, before we add 4 to both sides, let's distribute the 8. 2, and now we add 4 to both sides. So y is equal to 8x. Um, so how should we write this? How about plus 4 minus 8 log 2? Sounds good to me. Um, yep, so that's the equation of the tangent line. And you can factor out a 4 here. I don't think that's all, that's all that necessary, but OK, fair enough. log 2. And you can write this as log 4, but uh, let's not go crazy here. This is, this is fine. This is fine, too. All right, so equation of the tangent line. Uh, again, that's just the equation of any line with slope m and passing through the point x0, y0. So those are just numbers. And to find m, because it's a tangent line, you have to use the derivative. Um, right, the slope of the tangent line is the derivative at that point. All right, uh, this is a tricky one. Number six, y equals x to the power 2x plus 1. Find the derivative. Okay, so the issue here is that you, right, you're, you're not allowed to use the power rule because this power is not a number, right, like pi was for that, that problem we just did some time ago, right? So you can take the derivative of, you know, x to the 2, or x to the 3, or x to the pi, or x to any number. But because this is a function of x, the power rule does not apply here, right? And then neither does this rule, right? Remember the derivative of a to the x, but this is not an a. This is not a number. So that rule doesn't apply. So you, can't, you cannot use the power rule. You cannot use the exponential rule. When you have x in both the base and the exponent, yep, that's a tricky problem. And, the, you know, it's, you can think about it for a second, but the only way I know how to do this, to get this out of the exponent, is to take the logarithm first, right? So this is logarithmic differentiation. So take the log of both sides, the log of y on the left, and the log, natural log, of course, of x to the power, oops, 2x plus 1 on the right, right? And the, the reason for doing this is that, we, right, we have this rule for logarithms here. Maybe you remember it. The log of a to the b is just b times the natural log of a. In other words, this exponent can come in front. 
So likewise, this 2x plus 1 can now come in front. And that's the key here. So this will be 2x plus 1 times the natural log of x. Right. Now we can take the derivative. Right. So now we can take the derivative. And in fact, uh, the left side is pretty basic, right? Natural log of y, you know the derivative of that. And for the right side, this is going to be a product rule. Yep, so it's a product, right? 2x plus 1 times log x, right? Uh, all right, left side first. The derivative of log y is 1 over y. Yes, of course, chain rule. Don't forget the chain rule means we multiply by the derivative of y, right? Because this is not x. So that's the chain rule. In fact, that's, that's the answer, right? This will be the derivative. That's what we're looking for up here. Okay, so before we do that, obviously we'll have to multiply by y. But before we do that, we'll take the derivative, right? So first times the derivative of the second. The derivative of log x is, again, 1 over x. No chain rule needed here. So we're taking the derivative with respect to x, right? Plus second times the derivative of the first. The derivative of the first is just 2, right? So let's clean this up a little bit here on the right. This is going to be 2x over x, which is just 2, plus 1 over x, plus 2 times log x. Uh, yeah, that's fine, right? And on the, on the left side, this was 1 over y times the derivative of y. So to find the derivative, all we need to do now is multiply both sides by y. I was going to do it on the right, but it doesn't matter here. Yep, so the y's cancel, so we get dy by dx equals y, but remember y was x to the 2x plus 1 times 2 plus 1 over x plus 2 log x, and that's good enough for me. If you really insist on getting a common denominator here, you could write this as, well, let's see, x to the 2x plus 1 times 2x plus 1 plus 2x log x all over x. Um, yeah, that's okay, too. Either way is fine. Okay, so, yep, that's, uh, again, that was a tricky one because neither the power rule nor the exponential rule apply. When you have x in both the base and the exponent, log, take the log first. Logarithmic differentiation. Okay, I almost wasn't going to do number seven. Um, it's, it's a tricky one. It's, it's, not a, it's not a simple problem. But it's, it, I think the concept, especially if you go on to calculus two and differential equations and, and any, any physics course, this is kind of a, an important topic here. This has to do with uh, what's called harmonic motion. So harmonic motion could be a pendulum. It could be uh, hanging a mass from the ceiling on a spring. So this is a little spring here, right? And so it just basically bounces back and forth, right, in this sine or cosine wave. And in fact, it can be some combination of a sine and cosine wave, right? So that's where this is important. And so what's the maximum value? So here we're treating a, b, and this looks like a w here. It's actually the Greek letter omega. And that has to do with the frequency of the, of the motion, how quickly this goes back and forth. The bigger the omega, right, the faster it goes back and forth. The smaller the omega, the slower it goes back and forth. Um, so that's, that's omega. That's uh, not a w. But if you say w, I'll know what you mean. Most people make that mistake. Anyways, all right, so how do you find the maximum value of, of anything? Well, remember, for a maximum, when you're at the maximum here, or here, right? Uh, what's happening at the maximum? The slope is zero, right? So the derivative is zero. So take the derivative and set it equal to zero, right? So yep, 
Remember, a and omega are constants, so you don't need the product rule here, you just need the constant times function rule. So this is just going to be a times the derivative of sine is cosine of omega t. But remember, by the chain rule, we have to multiply by the derivative of omega t, which is just omega. So if it's all the same to you, I'm just going to multiply by omega, and I'm going to do that on the left here. Right. And then the same thing here. Right? We have a b, and then the derivative of cosine is minus sine, and now we have another omega by the by the chain rule, right? So there's the derivative, a omega cosine omega t minus b omega sine omega t. So that's the slope at any point, but we want, we want to know where the slope is zero, right? Because at the maximum, you have a horizontal line here, right? So, so what do we do? We solve for t here, right? And this is a, not a standard equation to solve, but one way to do it is to, say, add this to both sides. So you have a times omega cosine of omega t equals b times omega times sine of omega t. Right? And you can divide both sides by, uh, yeah, let's divide both sides by, say, cosine. So that gives you tangent, right? sine over cosine. So on the left, they cancel. So we still have a omega equals b omega, but now it's times the tangent of omega t. Right. And now we can divide both sides by b times omega. Right. So these cancel, and in fact, the omegas cancel as well. And so this gives you the following equation here. I'm going to switch sides. I'm going to put the tangent of omega t on the left side. And on the right side, we just have a over b. Okay. So what's omega t? Omega t is the arctangent or inverse tangent of a over b. So to solve for t, not that it was necessary, but t is 1 over omega times the arctangent, or inverse tangent, of a over b. Right. So, right, these are our critical numbers. These are where the derivative is 0. And I say numbers, of course, because, well, a, a and b could be numbers, omega could be a number, and remember, arctangent is a function, so that I guess technically this should only be one number here. This is our critical number, but it does depend on a and b and omega. All right, so, so how does that help? Well, going back to the picture here, when you have a sine or cosine function, and you, right, you're looking for the maximum here, and that's where the derivative is zero, you want to know the maximum value. You want to know the y-coordinate here. So we're going to plug this t into here and here, right, in the original function. Okay. So, so yeah, to do that, let me, let me rewrite the, the original value of y here. Uh, yep, I'll do that over here. So y was a cosine of omega t plus b times sine of omega t. Right. And as mentioned, we're just going to replace t with all of this stuff here, as well as this t here as well. So it's a lot of algebra, but let's do it. So we have a times the cosine of, notice the omegas cancel here. Omega times 1 over omega is 1. So this is just cosine of arctangent of a over b. Can try that again. That's an a over b plus b times the sine of, again, omega over omega is 1, arctangent of a over b. And there you go, right? That's, that's, the, that's the maximum value. Uh, by the way, it's, it could also be the minimum value 
right? Um, but so how do we how can we tell which it is here, which is which? Well, this is as you can guess, this is not the best way to write the answer, right? Y I mean, look, you can leave it like this, but it's kind of a mess, and it's very confusing um, to have the sine of the arctangent and all that. So what we're going to do is what you did in your trigonometry course, your pre-calculus course, is to think of this, this thing here as just an angle. I'm not going to call it omega because that's an angular frequency. I'll call it theta, right? So this is b times the sine of some angle theta, right? Where I define this theta. Theta is just the arctangent of a over b. It's just some angle. Right, in radians, or degrees, whatever you prefer. Right? It doesn't matter to me. Um, so, so what that means is that if I take the tangent of that angle, I just get A over B. Right? So I, I undid the arc tangent, the inverse tangent, and I just got the tangent. Right? So that's just the inverse function of tangent. Okay, so far? So what is this? Right? If you remember, you draw your little right triangle here. I'll try to make it a right triangle if I can. That's a little better. Yep. Yeah. So if this is my angle theta here, remember tangent Sokatoa. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. So this is the opposite. This is the adjacent. How do you find the hypotenuse? Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping you know that. That's, right, Pythagorean theorem here, right? right? Where this is our C here, right? So C is just the square root of A squared plus B squared. Okay. With me so far? Yeah, see, this involves a lot of trigonometry, pre-calculus, not just calculus, not just critical numbers, right? Um, all right, so why did we need to do this? Well, because we're taking the sine of theta, right? What's the sine of theta? Sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. So the opposite is still A, but the hypotenuse is C, or square root of A squared plus B squared, right? And then the same thing with the cosine of theta. Cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. The adjacent is this b here, right? So b divided by the square root of a squared plus b squared. And now, right, this is all, this is all going to be plugged in here. So this is your y. That's the value here. So we have a times cosine. Cosine is b over the square root of b, a squared plus b squared. Hang on. Um, let's see, tangent A over B. Uh, yeah, this is this is wrong. This is not what I'm. This is not what it should be here. Oh boy! All right, there's there's always something that goes wrong, right? And uh, now I know what I did wrong. So it, I wrote the problem down wrong. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, the A's and B's are switched. You see that originally the problem as written on the... Oh no, it's written, it's written correctly. A sine omega plus B cosine omega. Uh, okay. So I wrote it down correctly. Okay, so it's got to be something else. Uh, I took the derivative, right? I added this to the right. That's fine. I divided by cosine. That's correct. So this is tangent. This is A over B. Huh. Oh, I did. I did change A and B here. I wrote it down wrong here. So I had it right up here. This is correct. But notice down here I switched them. Okay. Well, that's an easy fix. So give me one minute and I'll fix that. 
yeah, actually, let me, all right, so let me do this in real time here. So this B should have been an A, or this A should have been a B, and this B should have been an A. Yep, always something. Yeah, so this was a B here, this was an A here. So that means this should be a B, this should be an A. Um, this will take a while to fix. Basically, at this point, switch all your A's and B's. Just switch all your A's and B's. Okay, so that means this is a B and this is an A. Uh, so, yep, so that means this is a B here. I'll s stick with yellow. All right, so this is a B here, right? And then this is an A times, so, well, sine of theta oops, is right here, right? A over square root of A squared plus B squared. So, yeah. A over square root of A squared plus B squared. There we go, right? So you're going to get B squared, uh, same denominator, right? So B squared plus A squared all over the square root of A squared plus B squared. But a squared, b squared plus a squared is the same as a squared plus b squared. Right. And finally, you can simplify this. This is really just the square root of a squared plus b squared. And that's the answer. Right. That's the answer. Um, yeah, I, I hope I didn't confuse you on that last step here, right? If, if you just have x over the square root of x, remember that's just x to the 1 divided by x to the 1 half. So this is x to the 1 minus 1 half, which is x to the 1 half, which is also the square root of x. So I'm just using a squared plus b squared for x here. Anyways, so that, that okay, so a little, little slip up there, but everything is right here with the triangle. Uh, I just accidentally, I did the cosine first here, which... This is probably usually the way it's done, but here I did, it's a, a times sine plus b times cosine. Um, so, so yeah. So this is the maximum value here. Um, what do you think the minimum value is? So if I ask for the minimum value, remember, it's plus or minus the square root, so it would just be the negative square root of a squared plus b squared. So you're just going between the negative and the positive back and forth like this, right? So this would be the positive square root, and then the minimum would be at negative square root. Um, but in any event, I just asked for the maximum, so you didn't have to worry about the plus or the minus here. So yeah, like I say, not an easy problem. It's one that involves a lot of trigonometry, a lot of pre-calculus going through the triangles. You have to know your SOHCAHTOA. You have to know inverse tangents. Um, all that stuff comes into play here. So that made this a tricky problem, but it is it is a good problem going forward, especially if you're going to continue on into higher level STEM courses, especially physics or engineering or, uh, or, or differential equations. So I hope that helps. All right, I'm going to go on to number 10. Uh, so we have a cylindrical tank with a radius of 5 centimeters. So I drew, a, as best as I could, a little cylindrical tank here. And this is the radius, right? So this is your 5 centimeters. The diameter would be 10 centimeters, right? And we have a, a piston. A piston is just a little device here, this thing right here, which allows you to move back and forth, right? So that changes the volume inside the tank here. Um, so this is the tank with volume V in here. And we're moving the piston in such a way that its height is 8 over T centimeters. And T is bigger than or equal to 1 cent. So we're starting our clock at 1 second. Obviously, we can't start at 0 because we'd be dividing by 0. right? So in other words, when T is 1, we're starting at 8 centimeters. And what happens is the piston just slides down lower and lower, decreasing the volume. So find the rate of change of the volume V when the height is 2 centimeters, right? So 
That's the question, right? How do you find the rate of change of the volume? By now, you should know that's the derivative of the volume, right? With respect to t, so this is changing over time, right? So, so what's the volume of a cylinder? Well, it doesn't say in the problem, but you can look it up. It's pi r squared, that's the area of the circle, times the height, h, right? So this is the volume of a cylinder. Um, you know, we've seen this so many times that hopefully you remember it by now, but if not, you can look it up. Um, on a test, it'll be, it'll be given to you on the problem, right? So this will be given. You don't have to remember this, um, although it's a good idea, but uh, you don't need it, right? So th this is given on the test, right? So let's just uh, go ahead and take the derivative, I suppose. Um, so pi, of course, is a constant, so we can just bring that out. And then multiply by the derivative of, uh, oops, sorry, no pi anymore, right? So r squared times h. Well, um, th actually, there's a couple ways of doing this, right? This implies we need the product rule here. So I guess I'm going to use the product rule, right? First times the derivative of the second plus second times the derivative of the first. The derivative of r squared is 2r times the derivative of r by the chain rule. Okay. Um, and some of you are probably thinking this wasn't necessary. We know that h is 5. Uh, or we, sorry, we know that r is 5, right? So r is a constant. r is just 5. We could have plugged that in here right away. But too late, right? <laughs> so it's OK, right? Because if r is a constant, that means that the derivative of r is 0 and that, that this whole term is just 0. OK. So what you end up with is just pi r squared times the derivative of h. Now, the derivative of h, remember, this height is changing. It's going up or down, and I think it's just going down here. Um, so, so, yeah, that's not 0, right? But r, well, yeah, r is just 5. So this is pi times 5 squared, sorry, times the derivative of h, which is 25 times pi times the derivative of h. Okay. Yeah, look, we could have done that right away, right? We didn't have to do any of this product rule business because v is really just 25 pi times h. And now when you take the derivative, you don't need the product rule. You just need the constant times the function rule. So see how much easier that was? If we had just plugged in the r is equal to 5 right away, we could have avoided all this product rule business. But it doesn't matter, right? Either way, we got, the, we got the same thing here. 25 pi times the derivative of h. But what's the real question is, what's the derivative of h? So here's h, right? h is just 8 over t. Right. Or if you prefer, 8 times t to the negative 1. So now we just have to find the derivative of h. I think you can handle that negative 8 t to the negative 2, or negative 8 over t squared, right? Yep, there no logs here. We're not taking the integral, right? We're taking the derivative, so, so yeah. Anyway, so plugging that in here, that's going to be 25 times pi times negative 8 over t squared. Um, I'm r running out of space here, so let's... Write this down here. Um, well, yeah, let's let's go back over here now, right? So the derivative of v is 20, 25 times pi times negative 8 over t squared. So 25 times 8, I think, is 200. So we have negative 200 pi all over t squared. Okay, so that's the derivative of the volume. Now, what do we plug in? We plug in h is equal to 2, but there is no h, right? Right? What is t? Right? We know h is 2, 
2 centimeters, what is t? Right, so don't plug in t equals 2. Well, yeah, go back to your or given equation here, right? h, if you remember h, h is just 8 over t. So if you know h is 2, you can solve for t. I'll give you five seconds to do that. <laughs> Yep, multiply by t and divide by 2, so t is 4. Okay, so that answers the question, what is t when h is 2, t is 4 seconds? So, in other words, the height of the cylinder here will be 2 centimeters, but it's going to take 1, 2, 3, 4 seconds to get the piston down that low. Okay, so 4 seconds later, now the height is only 2 centimeters. Make sense? All right, so plugging in your 4 seconds here, you're going to get negative 200 pi over 4 squared. 4 squared is 16. So negative 200 pi over 16. So 200, 200 over 16, um, well, on your calculator, negative 12.5 times pi, or if you prefer, you can write it as negative 25 pi over 2. So what are the units here? Volume is in square, no, cubic centimeters. Time was in seconds, so cubic centimeters per second. S for seconds, right? So Either way is fine. Yep, don't forget the units. Units are very important, especially in your science classes and your engineering classes. They will mark it completely wrong if you don't put the units as they should. Obviously, I'm going to be a little more uh, uh, lenient about that if you don't include the units here. Um, you know, you, you'll probably get a point taken off for that, but it's it's not a big deal. Mostly, I'm concerned with the method, how you solve the problem. You know, using either the product rule or the constant times function rule. Um, and it's really the chain rule that we applied here, right? We could have used the chain rule right off the bat, right? The derivative of v with respect to t is really the derivative of v with respect to h times the derivative of h with respect to t. So we did calculate the derivative of v with respect to h. That's really just the 25 pi. And then times the derivative of h which we got, uh, well, here, it's negative 8 over t squared, which is negative 1 half, right, negative 8 over 16. So, yeah, negative 1 half centimeters per second. Right. So, we could have plugged that in down here, but uh, we, got, we got it anyways. So, I hope that helps, uh, again, so not a trivial problem. It's a re related rates problem, related rates, and uh, there's plenty more of those in the book and in the homework in section 2.6, yep, so 2.6. Um, okay, hope that helps. And we might as well do number 11. So we have a rectangular box with a square base, and you can see I drew the box over here. Um, so the base is square, so the length is x, the width is x, but the height could be different, right? The height could be, let's say, h, right? And again, this may or may not be drawn to scale, but I tried to draw a square base with a different height, right? The height could be bigger, though, right? So you might have a box that looks like this, right? Again, we really don't know. At this point, uh, all we know that it's the square base here, right? Okay. I mean, for all we know, the height could be the same as the, the, the length or the width. In that case, it would be a cube. So, yeah, let's not assume that. And so what do we need? We need the sum of the length and the height, right? So this is given the sum of the length of the height has to be 12 feet. Okay. So, yep, we are given the sum of the length, length is x, and the height is h, that has to be 12 feet. Right? 
So we want to maximize the volume, find the maximum volume of the box. So what's the volume of a box? Yeah, th this we're not going to give you. This you should know, right? Length times width times height, right? Volume of a, of a rectangular box, right? The length is x. The width is also x because it's a square base. And the height is, well, I'll call it little h because that's what I did over here. Um, so this is just x squared times h. Okay. So notice the volume depends both on the length and the height. It's a function of two variables, x and h. So how do you maximize such a thing? Well, you take the derivative and you set it equal to zero. Remember that? Critical number. Find the critical numbers. But we don't know how to do that, right? How do you take the derivative of something of two variables? We've never done that. You'll have to wait until calculus 3 to know how to do something like this. Um, but the point is we don't have to because we have this given condition here, right? Remember what we call this, right? This is our primary equation. This is the thing we want to maximize or minimize. This is the secondary equation, right? This secondary equation relates the two variables. So x and h are not independent. They are related, right? And you can see that in the equation. If you increase x, right, you have to decrease h to keep, to keep the same sum. Right? So this could be 6 plus 6 equals 12. It could be 7 plus 5, right? or it could be 5 plus 7. So if, one, if the x goes up, h goes down, and vice versa. If x goes down, h goes up. Okay? So they're related. They're related. Right? And that's, that's the key here. Right? We can, if we want this to be a function of just x alone, we have to eliminate h. And we can eliminate h by solving for it. Right? Subtract x from both sides. And h is just 12 minus x. So plug that in here, and you get x squared times 12 minus x instead of x squared times h, right? So now this is volume strictly in terms of x as a function of x alone, right? So we've reduced this equation, the primary equation, down to a function of just one variable. Okay, so we needed to do that so that we know how to take the derivative. Remember, we want to maximize the volume, so maximum means critical number, right? Where is the derivative equal to zero? Where is the slope of the tangent line equal to zero? Right? So take the derivative, set it equal to zero. Now, in this form, we would have to use the product rule because it's a product. On the other hand, you can easily multiply this out, right? This is going to be 12x squared minus x cubed. So in that form, it's a little easier to take the derivative. We just get 12 times 2x minus 3x squared, or if you prefer, 24x minus 3x squared. So remember, we want to know where the derivative is 0. So solve this equation. I mean, it shouldn't take you more than 30 seconds, right? It's a quadratic equation. But you can factor out an x. In fact, you can factor out a 3x. And you just get 8 minus, um, yeah, 8 minus x equals 0. So we actually get two solutions here. We get x equals 0 or x equals 8. OK? Which one makes sense? So remember, x is a length, right? So we can make x as small as we want here, right? We can make x very, very tiny. And that just, oops, it's very hard to do a vertical line here. Let's try that again. All right, close enough. Ah, OK, I can't do it. But you get the idea, right? You can make x as small as you want. But if x is 0, then the length is 0. There's no box, right? So x equals 0 is just meaningless. It doesn't fit the parameters of the problem. If x is 0, there's no length at all. So yeah, x could be very tiny here, but it can't be 0. Let's 
is my problem here, right? It can't be zero. So it ha x has to be greater than zero. That's the domain of the problem here, right? X, x has to be greater than zero. I didn't mean to use red here, sorry. Um, yeah. So x has to be positive. And obviously, h should also be positive as well. If h is zero, then there's no height. And then there's no box at all. The volume would be zero. OK, so there you go, right? So there's only one realistic critical number, and that's x equals 8. OK, so if you get two critical numbers and they both make sense, then you got to deal with them both. But x equals 0, yep, that doesn't make any sense here, not for this physical situation. OK, well, if that's the, uh, if that's the critical number, what do we do with the x equals 8? That, remember, that's 8 feet, 8 feet. Um, so if x is 8 feet, we, can, we now know what h is. Right? Remember what h was. h was 12 minus x. So 12 minus 8 is 4. So yep, the height, or sorry, the, the, length is, the length and width are 8 feet, and the height is 4 feet. And so that tells me that my first picture up here was, was probably a little bit more accurate, right? Yeah, the height is half the length. So that looks about right if I do that, right? Yeah, yeah the height is not bigger than the length. So the box looks more like this, right? Obviously, you can make a box like this, but the volume would be less. The volume would not be maximal. We wanted the maximum volume and... To, so with this given condition, this is how we should construct the box. With a length of 8 feet and a height of 4 feet, and the maximum volume, of course, because uh, I think that was the question, find the maximum volume. Well, remember, the volume was x squared times h, so that's going to be 8 squared times 4. So 64 times 4 is 256 cubic feet. Right? So yeah, a very big box, obviously, when it's eight feet long, eight feet wide, and four feet tall. Um, but yeah, th those are the dimensions we want, right? So that should answer the question, right? The maximum volume should be 256 cubic feet, and the dimensions are basically eight feet by eight feet, and then the height is four feet. Right. And you can check 8 times 8 times 4 is the 256. So I hope that helps. Um, and so th this, I think, is a very reasonable question. It's not, uh, it's not tricky or anything. It's just wrapping your head around, you know, the, the dimensions of a box, length times width times height. Again, that you should know. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just, you know, it's not, it's not a cone or a fancy frustrum of a cone or a, you know, a pyramid or anything crazy like that. It's just a box, right? So, okay. There is a part B here. I, I'm not sure I even want to get into it, but let's, I guess let's do part B as well. So part B, again, same situation, but now we want to find the maximum surface area of the box. Okay, so let's go back to our picture here. What's the surface area, right? So this is not an open box. This is a closed box. We assume it's closed. So we have the top and the bottom are just squares, right? X times X is X squared. So the area of the top, right, is X squared. The area of the bottom, right, is X squared. So when you add those together, you just get 2X squared. So this is for the top and bottom of the box. Sorry, um, right. But that's not all. You have the, the sides of the box. And notice that all four sides are equal here. This side here, right, when I draw it this way, right, has height h and length or width x. So the area of that side is just x times h. But all four of these are equal. So there's four sides, right? Front and back, left and right. So the total area of the four sides is 4xh. So 
So 4xh. So these are for the sides. Okay. All right, so again, we have the area, but it's expressed as a function of both x and h. Well, um, yeah, so we reduce this down to a function of one variable, and we do it the same way, right? So it's the same situation as up here. h is just 12 minus x. Right? So this h here is still 12 minus x. And when you plug that in, what do we get? Well, let's multiply it all out. 2x squared plus 48x minus 4x squared. I think that's going to be negative 2x squared plus 48x. Sorry, that's supposed to be a 4. A little better, 48x. Okay. All right, so now we've reduced this down to a function of one variable. So how do you maximize something? You take the derivative, right? Either way, a prime of x. So that's just negative 4x plus 48. So there's no issue here. There's only one critical number, right? When you solve this for x, you just get 12. So that's the one and only critical number. So what does that mean? Well, it means the right the eight, uh, h, since x is 12, h is 12 minus 12, which is 0. So h equals 12, uh, sorry, x equals 12 feet, sorry, feet, and h equals 0 feet. But remember earlier we said that, look, it, x couldn't be 0, right? We discarded that, and h can't be 0. If h is 0, all you're left with are these two plates, right? These two squares, right? One right on top of each other, but h is 0. So there's no box here. There's just the two squares. So you do have a surface area, right? The surface area is going to be 2 times 12 squared, which is 144 times 2. I want to say 288 square feet. But at this stage, there is no box. Right? So this is kind of a, kind of a ridiculous answer here. Um, th that's why the question says to explain. <laughs> what do we mean by the maximum surface area? Well, the maximum surface area, right, occurs when there's no box, when the height is zero. So the maximum area occurs when h equals zero. So there is no maximum surface area, right? Right, and in fact, there's probably no minimum surface area either. Um, oh, well, I guess the minimum surface area would be zero when h uh, when x is zero. Yeah. So yeah. So the minimum surface area is zero, and that just occurs when x is zero. So yeah. Again, kind of a boring question there. Um, and to be fair, part B really was kind of a trick question because the maximum occurs at the endpoint, right? Remember. The, the year, it just happens to be a coincidence that the critical number happened at an endpoint, right? So if, right, so x can be no bigger than 12, right? So what happens is, um, uh, yeah, I think this at 0 is 0 when x is 0, and then the graph just goes up, and then it stops right at 12. So that's the, this is area as a function of x. That is the maximum surface area, right, 288. Uh, but it occurs at an endpoint of the domain. Right? So that is a possibility um, for these problems. You do have to be aware of that. Um, but, but still kind of a trick question, right? Part A is very reasonable. Part A has a legitimate answer. And a legi right? You get a legitimate box out of it, an actual box. This is not a box. This is just, right, two squares. but no height. All right, uh, I hope that helps. Um, maybe I'll do a few more. Okay, so this 
this will be an indefinite integral, number 15. Um, yeah, I'm skipping some of the trickier word problems. I think number 12 and number 14, uh, you know, they're, they're good problems, but uh, they, they will take you a while. Right? Those, those, they would take me a while. Um, and uh, so I, I would spend a little bit of time thinking about them. And I think once you get the idea of it, uh, once you get sort of the geometry of it, uh, for number 12, it's Pythagorean theorem. And for number 14, it's actually more of a physics problem. Number 14 has to do with units. Um, so you have to change from miles to feet and from hours to seconds and all that. So that's, that's why that one's tricky. Um, in any event, I'm just going to go on to some more recent stuff, indefinite integrals here. And, uh, you know, part A, I think, is very reasonable. You should do part A. Part B is a little tricky because it's a fraction. And remember, there's no quotient rule for integrals. There's no quotient rule. So don't even think about trying to take the integral of this and the integral of this. Not going to work. Nothing you can do with that independently. Right? It, yeah. Um, yeah, so if you're taking the derivative, then by all means, just use the quotient rule, right? So what can we do here? So there's two options, right? The way I, and I did one like this in, I forgot what section, section 4. Point, uh, well, at this stage, I think it was probably chapter 5. So 5.2 maybe, 5.1, 5.2. Um, but in any event, one way to do it is by substitution. Let u be the denominator. Okay, so that's one way to do it. And I think I did it that way in one of the video, pre, pre, uh, prior videos. So I'm going to do it a different way. I'm not going to use substitution. I'm going to divide. Right? We're just going to do long division, divide top and bottom. This is something you did long, long time ago in your algebra courses which is why we made you do it, because it's, it comes up again, right? Um, and in fact, I'm not going to do this the long way. I'm going to use synthetic division, because it's much faster. Right? You remember how this works. You just bring down the first number. 2 plus 0 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. So that goes in the next column here, 4. 7 plus 4 is 11. 11 times 2 make sure this is right. Yeah, 11 times 2 is 22, and 22 minus 3 is 19. So what do these numbers mean? These are the coefficients, right? 19 is the remainder, right? So this is going to be 19 over x minus 2. 11 is the constant, and then this is 2x. So when you divide, you get 2x plus 11 minus 19 over x minus 2. Right, so that does not give us the integral. All we did was we simplified. We rewrote the integrand as 2x plus 11 and then minus 19 over x minus 2. Right. Why did we do that? Well, remember, there's no quotient rule, but there is a sum rule and a difference rule. Right, so now we can split this up as three separate integrals. We can do the integral of 2x. That you should know. We can do the integral of 11. That's obvious. And I'm going to, the 19 is a constant. I'm going to pull that outside. And so this is the integral of 1 over x minus 2 dx. And that you should know as well, although you might have to think a little bit about that. So I'll give you a little bit of time to, to do this. In the meantime, uh, the integral of 2x, of course, is just x squared. The integral of 11 is 11x. Yep. And so technically, there is a, a little miniature substitution here. u is x minus 2, but du is just dx. So you're just doing the integral of du over u, right, which is um, natural log absolute value of u. This, is, this was from chapter 5, right? So that, that's why this is a chapter 5 problem. Oops, 11x. Minus 19 times the natural log of absolute value of u, which is x minus 2. We do need absolute value here because 
you never know what if x is 0. Then, then you're taking the log of negative 2, which is undefined, right? So we need absolute value here. Okay, so that's it. All right, um, I'll do one more. Uh, how about part C? Well, part C should be very quick here. So this is 15c. We're going to do the integral of secant of 2x plus tangent of 2x dx. Um, so obviously another miniature substitution, u is 2x, du is 2 dx. So we'll multiply by 2 on the inside, divide by 2 on the outside. And now you just get 1 half the integral of secant of u plus tangent of u, and then this becomes du. Yep. All right. Well, what's the integral of secant? Right, of course. It's the natural log of absolute value of secant plus tangent. Yep. It's a good idea to remember that because I, I, I'm pretty sure that if you go back to uh, 5.2, I believe it was 5.2, uh, we derived this. And we did it by using a trick, by multiplying by secant plus tangent, right? So, yeah. Um, all right, we still have the 1 half because we're distributing that. What's the integral of tangent? It's just the natural log of secant. Well, that's not the standard way you probably remember it. You probably remember this as negative. Uh, nope, I didn't want to erase that. I'll erase the plus and make it a minus. Um, yeah, this is minus natural log of cosine. Oh, not x, sorry, u still. This is du, right, plus c. So there you go. You're, you're welcome to leave it like this. Um, but we can simplify it a little bit. In particular, this is going to be 1 half natural log of absolute value of secant plus tangent over a cosine um, plus c. But it's also, if you think of cosine as 1 over sine, it's 1 half natural log of secant times secant, which is secant squared plus secant times tangent. Again, don't forget the plus c. Um, and now, oh, oh yeah, you can't leave it like this. I forgot. We have to go back to x. u is 2x. So, okay, so this is 1 half natural log absolute value of secant squared of 2x plus secant of 2x times tangent of 2x. plus c. There we go. That's final answer. Okay, so yeah, again, these are ones that you should know. If you have to derive them, by all means, go ahead and do that, but especially the secant one, that's a tricky one. Tangent is just substitution, right? Tangent is sine over cosine, and then u is, you know, u is uh, sine of, no, u is cosine of 2x, right? Um, or in this in this case here for tangent, u is, or, well, you can't call it u anymore. I guess you have to call it w now. W would be cosine of, of u. Um, but, you know, which is why you should do it all at once, but it's fine. All right, uh, one more. How about d? So 5d, oh, no, I'm sorry, not 5, 15d. So we have the integral of x squared over 5 minus x cubed. Okay. Again, another quotient, but no quotient rule. This one is just straightforward substitution. So what should u be? Well, in some cases it is the numerator. That does happen occasionally. But that doesn't make any sense because if you take the derivative of x squared, you just get 2x, and that doesn't match the denominator, not even close. And in fact, even if it did match the denominator, it wouldn't matter because it has to be in the numerator. It has to be multiplying dx, 
not dividing by dx, right? So it's got to be x cubed, or better yet, how about the whole denominator, 5 minus x cubed? So then the derivative is just negative 3x squared dx. So there's your x squared dx in the numerator. There's your 5 minus x cubed in the denominator. Notice what we're missing here is just a number, negative 3. So I can multiply by that as long as I also divide by it. And so I get negative 1 third times the integral of du over u which is negative one-third. Well, we did this already, right? The integral of one over u is natural log of absolute value of u plus c. But what was u? It was five minus x cubed. Oh, I forgot natural log. That's, that's the key. That's the important part. And yes, this could be positive or negative, so I'll leave the absolute value. In fact, it never hurts to leave it, even if even if it's redundant. So I'll leave it at that. So yeah, substitution, substitution, substitution. Most of the integral problems will require substitution. Uh, I think I skipped part A here. I skipped 15A because that you didn't need substitution. That's pretty straightforward. Okay, and maybe we'll do one or two uh, definite integrals as well. All right, 16A. And this one actually is pretty straightforward. Even though you do need a substitution here, all right, u should be x plus 1. Your other option would be the square root of x plus 1. And I don't know if that works or not. It, it's not, it's, look, you, you can try it. Go ahead and try it, but I prefer just x plus 1. Right? And then du is just dx. So this becomes the integral of 1 over the square root of u du. Now, u is not 0 and 3, right? u is going to be, well, 0 plus 1, which is 1, and 3 plus 1, which is 4. Okay? So how do we integrate this from 1 to 4? Well, remember, 1 over the square root of u now, you have to be careful because the temptation is, and I, I saw some of you do this on your, your, your previous test, is you wrote this as the natural log of absolute value of square root of u. By the way, absolute value is not necessary here because the square root is positive. Either way, it's the wrong answer. Right? This is not the exception. This is the ordinary power rule. This is u to the negative 1 half. The exponent is not negative 1. It's negative 1 half. So this is just negative 1 half plus 1 divided by negative 1 half plus 1, right? No c here because we're going to plug in the 1 and the 4 later. But before we do that, what is this, right? This is just going to be uh, 2 times the square root of u, right? So when you plug in, let's scroll down a little, when you plug in the 4, you just get 2 times the square root of 4 minus 2 times the square root of 1. So this is 2 times 2 is 4, minus 2, so you just get 2. So, yep, the answer here is 2. Um, but again, you've got to show your work. You've got to show all this. You know, I know you know how to do this on your calculators. Well, most of you probably know, figured out how to do this on your calculators. But, uh, you know, if you just put down 2, you're not going to get any credit for that. You got to show your work. It's not much, right? But you got to show it. All right. So I guess I guess I'll do part B. So 16B is the definite integral from zero to one of x times e to the one minus x squared. One minus x squared being the exponent of e. Okay. So this is a product, right? And there's no product rule, right? Even if there was, you know how to integrate x. You do not know how to integrate this, right? You might be thinking, wait a minute. Yeah, I know how to integrate e to the 1 minus x squared, right? It's just e to the 1 minus x squared. No, it is not. Let's go through this again, right? The integral of e to the u is e to the u 
plus c. Right? But this is, this is not u, right? u would be 1 minus x squared. du would not be dx. This would be negative 2x dx, and what do you do with the x? Well, here there, there is no x, right? The, the negative 2 is fine. You can multiply by that and divide by it, but there's no x to deal with here. So, so as I said, you can't do that. We need the x, right? That x is crucial to do the substitution, right? So this is correct here. We do need a substitution. u is 1 minus x squared, so that du is negative 2x dx. So maybe I should rewrite this. This is the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the 1 minus x squared times x dx. So we still need the negative 2. That's not a problem. Multiply by negative 2 and divide by negative 2. Right? So we get negative 1 half. Definite integral from, well, before we put in the 0 and 1, let's do the substitution. The, the exponent was u, and then all of this is just du. Right? So what about the limits here? These are x's. What if we go to u? Well, what's 1 minus 0 is 1, and 1 minus 1 is 0. So notice that the limits just got switched here. If you want to switch them, if it looks backwards and you want to switch them back, just multiply by negative 1. So that'll change this to a positive 1 half. And then you're just going from 0 to 1, e to the u du. Right. And now you can take it from here, because right now it's pretty standard stuff. Is the integral of e to the u is e to the u. Uh, oh, don't forget the 1 half, right? And then just plug in the 0 and the 1. So this is 1 half e to the 1 minus 1 half e to the 0. But remember, e to the 0 is 1. So this is just e. You don't need the 1 here, right? e minus 1 over 2. And that's the way I would write it. If you want to leave it as 1 half times e minus 1, that's fine too. Exact answer. You can plug this in your calculator and get an approximation, but we're looking for the exact answer, as usual, right? So that was, sorry, that was 16b. Um, I think you can handle c. It's just another substitution. So I'll move on to d. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so we're going to evaluate this definite integral here. Uh, from 1 to e, remember e is a number, it's about 2.7, right? And we're integrating 1 plus log x squared, the whole thing squared, all over x. Okay. So remember, the, the rule of thumb is that u is usually the denominator, right? But that's not going to work here. Um, you never want to do u equals x. Because all that does is change, oops, change everything from u's to x's. But then... If these are all u's, you're in the same problem. You have the same exact same problem. Whether you call it x or u or w or z or q or p or y, doesn't matter. Right? It's the same problem regardless of what the letter is, what the variable is. Okay, so that's not going to work. So it's got to be either the numerator or, better yet, how about just what's in the parentheses? 1 plus log x. So what's the derivative of 1? 0. What's the derivative of log x? 1 over x. So du is just 1 over x times dx. And indeed, here's your 1 over x. Um, so maybe that's not clear, so let's just rewrite this. This is the integral from 1 to e of 1 plus log x, quantity squared, times 1 over x dx. Right? But there it is. That's my u. Right? So all of this, I'm uh, sorry, all of this is my du. Right? That, sorry, that's du. And then this is just u squared, right? So transforming this, you just get the integral of u squared du. What are the limits? Well, let's see. u is 1 plus log x. So 1 plus the log of 1, remember the log of 1 is 0. So that's just 1 plus 0, right? And then the log of e is 1 
So 1 plus 1 is 2. Right? So, yep, yeah, at this point, I'll give you 10 seconds to finish this. This is pretty standard at this point. The, the tricky part is getting the substitution right. right? Okay, yep, yeah, obviously, 1 third u cubed. No c here, just plug in the 1 and the 2. Now, some of you don't like to do like to find the, the new limits here, the upper and lower limits of integration. Um, so some of you do it like this. You change u back to x, so this is 1 plus natural log of x cubed, and then you just plug in the original limits, the 1 and the e, rather than the 1 and the 2. And I'll show you, you get the exact same thing. So it doesn't matter which way you do it, right? You're going to get 2 cubed, which is 8, right? 8 over 3 minus 1 over 3 which is 7 over 3. If you do it this way, and I'm going to run out of space here, but you're going to do, let's see, 1 third times 1 plus the natural log of e cubed minus 1 third times, oops, 1 plus the natural log of 1 cubed. So I mean, we did this already, but when you work it out, you just get 1 third times 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 cubed minus 1 third times 1 plus 0 cubed. So you still get 8 over 3 minus 1 over 3. You still get 7 over 3. That's supposed to be a 3 here. Let's try that again. Yep. So same answer. Um, I Personally, I just find this a little bit easier and faster having done, right, having switched the limits up here. Um, again, the 1 is the same, but the e got changed to a 2. So you can't plug in e here, you would get the wrong answer. You would get e cubed over 8 rather than 8 cubed over 8. Uh, sorry, 8 over 3. Right. So yeah, e cubed is a little bit bigger than 8, so that wouldn't work. Right. Um, in any event, uh, yeah, either way is fine. You get the same answer regardless. I like switching the, the limits rather than going back to x. Obviously, if this were a de an indefinite integral, Right, then you do have to go back to x. So the indefinite integral would be this. But when you're plugging in numbers here, it doesn't, you don't need the c. So for definite integrals, you just get a number. In this case, 7 over 3 or 2 and 1 third. Please don't do 2.33333. Three, three, three. I mean, I'll accept it or 2.3 repeating. Um, it's just more standard to leave it as a fraction. So don't do that. <laughs> it's just not the standard way to write the answer. The book would never write the answer like this, I don't, th I don't think. So just be aware of that. OK, and there's just a few more. I think I'll, I'll pick one of these. And some of these are a little bit tricky. 17, I think, is not trivial, but it is, it is doable. Um, I mean, you know all you know. You know everything you need to know to solve the problem. So it's it's not a tricky problem, I don't think. Um, and there's a couple ways of doing this, right? Uh, one way is just to do it directly. You can do this integral here. You can do this definite integral, right? And then you, what you get is a function of x because this is not a number; it's a variable. It's x, right? And then when you take the derivative of that with respect to x. Um, you get, a, you get another function of x. And then when you set that equal to 12, you just solve that equation, right? On the other hand, if you use the second fundamental theorem of calculus, I can't spell second, right? The second fundamental theorem of calculus, you can do this all at once, right? Because the derivative of the integral is the inverse of the process, right? They just cancel. So what you should get is just 3 over 4 minus x equals 12. Right? So, so doing this step by step will take you a lot longer, but you'll get the same thing in the, in the end. You'll still get this equation. Right? And you know how to solve this equation. You should pause the video, take, you know, take, take one minute and finish it. Right? You're just going to multiply both sides by 4 minus x. So you get... 48 minus 12x, uh, subtract the 48, I think you get negative 
5 is equal to negative 12x. So x is just 45 over 12. Let's see, I think we can divide by 3, and we get 15 over 4. So I think that does it. x is 15 over 4. Obviously, I don't care here. You could write this as um, 3.75, or 3 and 3 fourths. It's not a repeating decimal. It's a terminating decimal. So, so I think that does that. Um, yeah, so not, not a hard one. Again, it made a lot easier if you, if you knew the second fundamental theorem of calculus and applied it to this problem here. Okay, number 19. So number 18, you, we, you actually look back on your, your last test because there was one like that on your test. Um, so, so pretty standard problem there. Number 19 is a little trickier, so let's, let's, let's study this one here. They give us a function, right? This is a function defined as an indefinite integral, which is unusual, but uh, it is a function of x, right? Now, if you're thinking, well, how am I going to integrate this, right? Can I use substitution? Nope, because your du is 2t dt. The 2 is not the problem. The problem is there's no t here, right? You, you cannot multiply and divide by t. It's a variable, right? You can multiply and divide by 2, but that's still not going to cut it because you're missing a t. Okay, so point is none of that works. None of that works. Um, you know, so we don't know how to do this, right? Uh, if you want to learn how to do this, right, go on to take Calc 2. Uh, Professor Karnowski, or in the summer, Professor Dopern will explain how to do this, probably a lot better than I could. Um, so this is a Calc 2 problem. It's, it's a slightly more advanced problem. Uh, it's one that either uses trigonometric substitution. Actually, that's the only way I know how to do it, is to use a trig substitution. Okay. But that's a Calc 2 topic. We're not going to do it here. The point is, you shouldn't have to, right? How do we know if something is one-to-one? -one? What does one-to-one -one mean, right? It means, roughly speaking, that when you draw the graph of this, right, that, um, that it, it satisfies the horizontal line test, right? Horizontal line test just means that it doesn't, right, it doesn't cross. So, Essentially, this is either an increasing function or a decreasing function, and by the look of it, I, I would assume it's increasing. Right? If you were to graph 1 plus t squared, and I think it looks, actually, that looks something like this. Um, so, so be careful. Don't get mixed up with the two graphs here. Right? So if we're graphing this function, the square root of 1 plus t squared, um, when t is 0, you just get 1. And then it just kind of looks like this, right? So what's happening here, remember this is the area from t equals 2 to t equals x. And so when you're at x here, the y-coordinate, I'll call it a, is this area. Okay? So that's the idea here. The graph of this function, this f of x here, right, depends on the area that you get up until x. Okay, and now I have to now I have to revise this because this this graph is wrong here. Yeah. So why is it wrong? Because notice that when x is two, and this is kind of the key part of the problem. When x is two the definite integral is 0. So that means that when x is 2 here, let's say this is 1, this is 2, uh, the value of the function is 0, right? So I think it looks more like, like this. Um, yeah, something like that, right? In, in, in any event, yeah, so this, this still applies here, that when x, uh, when, you know, when, when you plug in x, you get the area from 2 to x. All right, either way, um, 
we can see that this is going to be one to one, right? It, it satisfies the horizontal line test. Every horizontal line crosses just once. So it is one to one. Now that for the second part, what's the derivative of the inverse of this function at zero? Okay, so you might you might wonder, okay, how am I supposed to take the how am I supposed to find the inverse of this? When I can't even find this, I don't even know how to integrate this. I don't know how to write it as an explicit function rather than as an integral. True, right? We don't know how to do that. So we don't know what the inverse is, right? We don't know what the inverse is. So how, if I don't know the inverse, how am I supposed to take the derivative? Yeah, tricky problem, right? That's a tricky problem here. You're right, we can't do this directly. Right? We have to use the fact that the derivative of the inverse is the reciprocal of the derivative of the original function, but you plug in f inverse of zero. Okay, yep, this, this was in 5.3, section 5.3. Review that very carefully because um, well, if we're, yeah, in the in the regular Larson book, it's section five point three, right? Um, and yeah, you could have used this on the on the test as well. Some of you did, some of you did it directly, but in this problem, we cannot do this directly, right? Because we don't know the inverse function, let alone how to take the derivative of the inverse function. So yeah, so we got to use this trick here, right? Now, before we take the derivative of this function, um, what's f inverse of zero? Well. If you don't know what the inverse function is, how can you plug in zero? You can't, right? You can't do that. But think about it for everything you, you know how to answer this, right? What is the inverse just at one value, just at zero? Okay, well, it's some number. But, uh, I don't wanna call it x. How about n for number? It's a number, right? It's a number that, such that when you plug it into the function up here, you get zero. So for what n, for what, a, or maybe I should have called it x. And let's go back and call it x, right? So for what x do you, does this equal zero? Yeah, it's right here. It's gotta be two, right? So f of 2 equals 0. Yeah, f of 2 is 0. And look at the graph, right? That's the x-intercept. When x is 2, y is 0, because there's no area from 2 to 2. So there you go. This is 2. Make sense? So now, we're going to take the reciprocal of the derivative, and after we take the derivative, we'll plug in 2. All right, so now how do we take the derivative? So let me just write down the original function. The function was the definite integral from 2 to x of the square root of 1 plus t squared dx, and now we need the derivative. And this was a problem on your last test. Some of you got it, a lot of you didn't because you didn't recognize that this is just the second fundamental theorem of calculus yet again. Oh, sorry, this is not an x, this is a t, right? But the definite integral is a function of x and when you take the derivative, it just undoes the integral, right? So this is nothing more than just the square root of one plus x squared, okay? Now plug in the 2 here, so f prime of 2 is the square root of 1 plus 2 squared, 1 plus 4 is 5, so the square root of 5. Right. But don't forget to take the reciprocal, this is 1 over the square root of 5, or if you rationalize the denominator, square root of 5 over 5. I would accept either, oops, I would accept either of course. You know, I'm not picky about rationalizing the denominator. Um, just recognize that the book will always do that. The book likes to write it in sort of a standard form where the denominator is rationalized. Um, 
but either way is fine with me. So the, again, tricky problem because you had to, you know, first figure out that it's one to one, and second, um, you know, figure out where how to how to how to be able to take the derivative of the inverse without finding the inverse or its derivative. Again, the key is to use this formula here. So if you don't know the formula, yeah, you're you're sunk. You're not going to be able to do this. Um, unless you happen to know trig substitution and can figure this out directly, but I, I doubt that. That's a Calc 2 problem. You will learn how to do that eventually, but, uh, but yeah, for this problem, we can do it using, using this formula here. Okay, so um, I think that's it. Uh, I'll, you know what? I'll do number 20. I know this is a long video already, but I think we can do number 20 very quickly. It's a pretty standard problem, right? You know how to find the area under a curve. So the curve here is 1 over x squared, which you can also write as x to the negative 2. And roughly speaking, the graph looks like this. All right? So you have your vertical asymptote, x equals 0. You have your horizontal asymptote, y equals 0. Um, right? So if you're going between, say, x equals 2 and x equals 12, you just want to calculate this area in here under the curve, but above the x-axis, obviously. So that's part A. To find the area, you just do the definite integral from 2 to 12 of 1 over x squared. Um, oh, I'll squeeze it in over here. Now, again, I hope you're not doing natural log of x squared. This is not the exception to the power rule. This is the actual power rule itself for integrals. All right, x to the negative 2. So n is negative 2. It's not negative 1. So negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. So this is just x to the negative 1 divided by negative 1. Uh, we don't need the c here because this is a definite integral. We'll plug in the 2 and the 12. Um, before we do that, though, this is really just negative 1 over x. Right. So it's negative 1 over 12 minus a negative, so plus 1 over 2. Right. So 1 half minus 1 twelfth. Well, so 6 over 12 minus 1 over 12 is 5 over 12. And that's the area here, right? The area is just 5 twelfths. It's a, it's a small area, right? It's less than 1. It's actually slightly less than 1 half, so it's a, it's a fairly small area. Okay, so part b, what's the area between x equals 2 and x equals, say, t? Right. So all we're thinking, instead of using 12 here, we're thinking about this as, a, as just a t, and we can slide this back and forth. Right, t could be whatever we want, and so we get a different area depending on t, right? So you do the same integral. This is negative 1 over x um, integrated between 2 and t. So this is negative 1 over t minus a negative 1 over 2, or just 1 half minus 1 over t. And of course, it depends on t. If t is 12, then you get the same answer we did up here, right? So that's a formula for the area between 2 and t. And then finally, for part c, what happens as t gets larger? In other words, let's take the limit as t goes to infinity of the area. Well, we already did this integral, right? It's just this up here. So we're taking the limit as t goes to infinity of 1 half minus 1 over t. By now, this should be obvious. I hope you recognize that, look, if t gets bigger, 1 over t gets smaller, right? You're going to infinity, so what's 1 over 1,000? What's 1 over a million? What's 1 over a billion, right? These are very small numbers, and they just get smaller and smaller. So yeah, this goes to 0. So you're left with 1 half minus 0, or just one half. Okay, so that's the answer for part C. Now, in terms of the graph here, that might seem a little bit surprising because, 
and I'm going to draw a slightly bigger picture here. So here's my t. Here's my uh, 1 over t, so, well, yeah, 1 over x squared. Uh, yeah, okay, well, okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right, so, so the graph is 1 over t squared. Let me draw that graph again here. Looks something like this. Careful not to cross it. Okay, good enough, right? And we're starting at t is equal to 2, or x equals 2, and then t just gets bigger and bigger. So for t, the area would be 1 half minus 1 over t, and it's just this, this area in here. You know what? I, I'm going to try to close this off here. Um, so that's between 2 and t. So that area is this. Now, when you keep going, t just, right, oops, t just gets bigger and bigger and bigger here. t keeps going to the right, further and further to the right. So you're adding more and more area here. Um, you're adding this much area, right? And so on. Uh, so you might, you might suspect that this area just gets infinite because it keeps going to the right forever. But look how small it gets, right? The further to the right you go, can I go to the right? Yeah, a little bit. Um, right, the curve just gets closer and closer to the x-axis, or the t-axis, right? So this gets very, very tiny here. So you are adding more and more area, but because it, it's so small, it practically becomes insignificant. So even though it's an infinite length, the total area is actually very tiny. It's just one half. Amazing, right? You have an infinite amount of space here because it's an infinite length, but it's a finite area. And this actually happens, right? So this, th this limit here does converge to a finite number. We say that this integral converges. So this is something, again, you're going to see more of in Calc 2 when you talk about uh, sequences and series and in terms of improper integrals. So, yep, you can think about this as the integral from 2 to infinity of 1 over x squared dx. And it turns out that that integral is really just 1 half. But infinity is not a number, right? It doesn't really make sense to talk about, well, you know, the integral from 2 to infinity. So the way you have to think of it is you have to think of it in terms of a limit, right? So that's why they, they call these improper integrals. So again, this is all just a setup for, uh, or a lead-in to Calculus 2. This is something you do in the latter half of Calculus 2. Um, so again, a good problem. Mostly Part A, you should know how to do. Part B is just in terms of a variable instead of instead of a, a number, but then you just get a formula in terms of t. And then part c is the tricky one. You're taking a limit as t goes to infinity, and not getting infinity, but getting a finite number is your answer, which is not what you would expect in terms of the area here, but that is indeed what happens. Um, although it's not, it's not guaranteed to happen. Um, Sorry about that. Yeah, it's not guaranteed to happen. In fact, if you go the other way, if you take this area in here, right, this actually turns out to be infinite. So, so just as one last thing, if you go from 0 to 2 of 1 over x squared dx, uh, yeah, this, we say that this diverges. The area becomes infinite. So even though this becomes smaller and smaller, it's not, as, it's not as small as it is over here. This is much smaller. This turns out to blow up and gets bigger. Sorry, B for bigger. Um, so yeah, even, even though this is, these are not infinite, um, it turns out that this uh, becomes so much bigger that it just diverges, right? It goes to infinity. So again, that's something for Calc 2. Anyways, I hope that this little review helps for, uh, you know, I, I didn't get to all of them, but you should certainly be able to do the others. I think the other, the most of the ones I skipped are either, either, you know, medium easy or medium, you know, not tricky, just reasonable, 
uh, routine problems. So I hope that helps. Uh, good, good luck. Good luck on your final. And I, I'd say, you know, I'll, I'll see you later, but I, I'm, I may not see you for a while. So, um, but uh, e either way, I hope this helps a little bit.